On the morning of August 6, 1945, a United States B-29 bomber named the Enola Gay took off from the north field on the tiny island of Tinian, 1,500 miles away from its target in Japan. Its payload had been delivered only days before by the USS Indianapolis, and it was a weapon of the likes the world had never seen before. At 8 a.m. local time, the bomber approached the military target, the major industrial city of Hiroshima. Earlier that morning, Japanese radar detected hundreds of bombers headed towards the area of South Japan, but only a small number headed for Hiroshima. Their greatest fear at that time was incendiary bombing of civilian populations, but that required a large number of bombers. Hiroshima was given the all-clear shortly past midnight. But at 7 a.m., an air raid alert was sounded when the reconnaissance plane Straight Flush was spotted overhead. That plane relayed a message to the Enola Gay, letting them know that cloud cover was thin and that they had the green light to bomb their target. Seeing only one plane in the sky, most citizens ignored the warning. At 8.09, Colonel Paul Tibbetts, the pilot of the Enola Gay, handed over the controls to his bombardier. Thomas Farabee. At 8.15, Farabee released the bomb, codenamed Little Boy. The weapon contained 64 kilograms of uranium-235, a new explosive that had only been successfully tested less than a month prior. From 10,000 feet in the air, the bomb dropped to a preset altitude of 1,900 feet and detonated not over its planned target of the IOE bridge, but 800 feet further away over the Shima Surgical Clinic. The bomb exploded with the force of 12,500 tons of TNT. Instantly, the temperature at the detonation site rocketed to 1 million degrees centigrade, forming a giant expanding fireball and subsequent mushroom cloud. In the center of Hiroshima, everything but reinforced concrete buildings disappeared instantly. Windows as far away as 10 miles from the hypocenter, or ground zero, were shattered. Over two-thirds of Hiroshima's buildings were destroyed in the initial blast, and hundreds of fires were started by the heat of the explosion. 80,000 people were immediately killed in the first second following detonation. Tens of thousands more would die from their injuries in the days after, and many more would suffer through a lifetime of pain and disfiguration caused by the nuclear explosion. On board the Enola Gay, Tibbets could feel the fillings in his teeth tingle as the metal interacted with the radiation from the bomb detonation. The towering mushroom cloud, composed of ground debris thrown up by the explosion, grew to a height of nearly 50,000 feet. That night, Enola Gay co-pilot Robert Lewis wrote in his log book, My God, What Have We Done? Greetings, kittens. Welcome to the Podcast of Doom, the podcast devoted to epic failure analysis. My name is David Appleson. I want to thank you so much for your patience and hanging in there while I took a sabbatical from this podcast to complete my certificate in electronic learning. If you're new to the podcast, I would like to say you have missed an awful lot. Devastating fires, man-eating tigers, genocide, hungry sharks, London's killer smog, Hungary's bloodthirsty countess, Portugal's triple whammy that began with an earthquake, 10,000 desperate refugees torpedoed at sea, a killer volcano, a power-hungry dictator, a toxic cloud from a chemical plant, a British debacle in Afghanistan, a plague that killed a third of Europe, and two fully loaded 747s crashing into each other. Today's episode will cover the bombing of Nagasaki. Future episodes will cover history's worst snow blizzard, a dam burst in central China, the Irish potato famine, and the cult of Reverend Jim Jones. Keep listening, keep supporting, keep sending your ideas. I'm already incorporating some of them. And keep telling your friends about the podcast. There seems to be a name for every ailment, but since I failed to find one for this podcast, I'm going to call it Sensitivity Fatigue. 
Sensitivity fatigue is that point in which a soldier, commander, or just your average citizen surrenders their concern about their fellow man and just wants the war to be over. One often overlooked factor when we examine such a catastrophe as the double atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki is how the public felt. Following the bombing of Hiroshima, most Americans, probably by a very large percentage, supported the dropping of a second atomic bomb. They hadn't forgotten the surprise conventional bombing of Pearl Harbor. They hadn't forgotten all of the bloody, hard-fought battles leading up to Hiroshima, including the intense struggle for Okinawa. The American public was not in a forgiving mood. The Japanese public was also committed to winning the war, even though that possibility had long passed. Honor was very important, and the honor of the nation and the emperor was most important. There was no shortage of volunteers for kamikaze missions towards the end of the war. Most Japanese were quite happy to die for their country. That's sensitivity fatigue. After you've been through so much and fought for so long, it doesn't matter how many of the enemy civilians you kill or how they die. You just want to win the war on your own terms. In this episode, we're going to examine the atomic bombing of Nagasaki, Japan, the event that brought World War II to a close and ushered in the Cold War and the arms race. We will also be looking at the bombing of Hiroshima, as it is impossible to discuss the one event without the other. This August will mark the 70th anniversary of both bombings, which means it is a good time to explore why the American leadership felt it was necessary to use the newly developed nuclear weapon on a large civilian population, why they felt it was necessary to drop another nuclear bomb on another civilian population just three days later, and why it was so difficult for the Japanese to surrender before and after the first bombing. At 8.15 on the morning of August 6th, 1945, 1,900 feet above downtown Hiroshima, the detonation sequence on the little boy device came to an end. The gun mechanism inside the bomb fired a uranium bullet at a uranium target, creating a critical mass of fissional material on impact. For a millionth of a second, the temperature above the city was equivalent to the temperature on the surface of the sun. When the weapon exploded over Shima Surgical Center, it instantly killed all of the patients, doctors, and nurses at the facility. The city was saturated with neutron and gamma radiation. A wave of heat charred every living thing within 1,500 feet of ground zero and scorched unprotected skin at one and a half miles away. On the ground, temperatures sustained a level of six to 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It is worth noting that iron melts at a temperature of 2,700 degrees. Tree leaves turned to ash and tree trunks exploded. Ponds and small lakes instantly evaporated and roof tiles melted. The shock and blast waves from the detonation rippled over the city, raising people, animals, and any objects not attached to the ground up in the air several feet. All wooden buildings within two miles were completely damaged, if not entirely burned to the ground. Brick buildings within the vicinity collapsed, and concrete reinforced buildings were severely damaged. The wind speed at ground zero was 980 miles an hour. For comparison, an F5 tornado is about 300 miles per hour. Within a one and a half mile radius of the blast, victims were burned, decapitated, disemboweled, crushed, and irradiated. The sudden drop in pressure blew people's eyeballs out of their sockets and ruptured their eardrums. Human bodies were wrenched apart by the shock wave. Those further away were charred by thermal rays. Many people were burned beyond recognition. Children working at the Hiroshima telephone exchange were electrocuted at their desks. Streetcars packed with morning commuters were thrown off their tracks and consumed in flames. Those far enough away to survive the blast were instantly dehydrated by the heat and radiation. The cry of Mizu, Mizu, or water, water, went up from the victims in the city. The agonizing sensation of thirst was worse than the pain of their wounds. For those who found water to drink, it did more harm than good. The instant rehydration of their bodies overloaded their systems and killed them in minutes. 
Thousands of people died attempting to drink water from burst pipes, puddles, garden ponds, and swimming pools. Which leaves us with the question, was this really necessary? Did so many people need to endure so much death and suffering in order to end the war? And what happened during those three days between the bombing of Hiroshima and the bombing of Nagasaki? Was the destruction of Nagasaki preventable? Perhaps the destruction of both cities was preventable. What events led to the development of the atomic bomb, and was the creation of nuclear weaponry inevitable? To answer those questions, let's start by looking at how the atomic bomb came into existence. It took a long chain of contributors and experimentations to develop the atomic bomb. In 1895, German physicist Wilhelm Röntgen discovered an invisible ray when he held his hand in the path of an electron beam streaming from a heated metal cathode. He projected the image onto a photographic plate that, when developed, showed the outline of the skeleton of his hand. Rutgen had discovered X-rays. The French scientist Henri Becquerel speculated that this invisible ray shared some properties with a strange glowing mineral called uranium. His compatriots, husband and wife team, Marie and Pierre Curie, observed the fluorescence of uranium and named this effect radioactivity. The Curies conducted many experiments with X-rays and pitchblende, which is a byproduct of silver mining, eventually extracting two intensely radioactive elements, polonium and radium. They discovered that some atoms are inherently radioactive and emit radiation. The American physicist Richard Feynman theorized that all atoms contain subnuclear particles that move around in perpetual motion, attracting and repelling each other. By wrapping uranium in aluminum foil, Ernest Rutherford, a New Zealand-born transplant working in Britain, discerned two types of radiation, alpha rays which were absorbed by the foil and beta rays which penetrated the foil. Frenchman Paul Ehrlich later discovered a third ray which he called gamma that penetrated concrete and steel. Later Rutherford and his protege Fred Soddy, while working with nitrogen, observed that sometimes elements spontaneously disintegrate or decay, turning into a whole different element. Many scientists wondered what was causing this decay. Was a separate particle causing the decay? Soddy theorized that energy was being released during the decay process. He calculated that one gram of radium would release 100 million gram calories of energy during disintegration. Rutherford realized that they were looking at a source of energy with unlimited potential. Curious minds began to wonder if this energy could be captured and used in a weapon. It was also around this time that Albert Einstein published his theories of relativity, including the special theory of relativity, which we know as the formula E equals mc squared. In this theory, Einstein argued that energy and mass are interchangeable, that mass can be converted to energy and energy can be converted to mass, leaving the question, just how much energy? That is where the C of the equation comes in. C equals the speed of light, or 186,000 miles per second. C squared equals that figure times itself, which is a very, very big number. But what good is a big number without context? You want to know what the big number means. Let's look at how much uranium mass was converted into energy in the little boy explosion. It turns out it was just one gram, which would fit on your thumbnail. Just one gram of uranium destroyed most of a major city. Niels Bohr observed that electrons, which are the particles that atoms are built from, will sometimes jump out of their orbits when they absorb external energy, but return to their orbits emitting energy. He called this phenomenon the quantum leap. In 1932, James Chadwick demonstrated that neutrons, the other particles that make up atoms, can break away from one atom and pass unimpeded into the nucleus of another atom. In 1933, the Hungarian Leo Szilard theorized that an element might exist which, when split by one neutron, would emit two neutrons, releasing energy in the process. If there was enough of this element, the process would continue. 
the collision of one neutron would release two more neutrons, which would collide and release four neutrons. Those would collide and release eight neutrons, continuing an exponential chain reaction. In one millionth of a second, a billion atoms would split, releasing all of their energy. But in order to sustain the reaction, a critical mass of the element was needed. It was during this time that Ernest Lawrence and his colleagues in Berkeley, California, were using a new invention, the cyclotron, a particle accelerator to smash apart various elemental nuclei. However, they had no luck sustaining a chain reaction. His team was expending more energy than they were creating with each collision. As the Nazis rose to power in Germany during the 1930s, many Jewish physicists moved out of Central Europe to other countries. Among those emigres was Einstein, Szilard, Eugene Wigner, and one of the great pioneering women of nuclear physics, Lisa Meitner. Szilard and Wigner met with Einstein in 1939 and together composed a letter sent to President Roosevelt urging him to begin development of a nuclear weapon program so that America could create the atomic bomb before Germany. However, the Germans already had a leg up on the Americans for this project. In 1938, Meitner's former partner, Otto Hahn, and fellow physicist Fritz Straussmann created and demonstrated the first fission or splitting of an atom by bombarding uranium atoms with neutrons, whereas Lawrence had been using protons. The uranium decayed into the lighter element barium. Meitner's nephew, Otto Frisch, soon realized what was going on. In the process of splitting, the two liberated nuclei had a combined weight that was less than the original single nuclei. So where did the missing weight go to? Remember Einstein's theory of relativity that states mass and energy are interchangeable. That's right, the missing mass had turned into energy. In fact, one atom of enriched uranium released enough energy to flip a grain of sand. One gram had the equivalent energy of three tons of coal, or three million times the energy equivalent of the same amount of fossil fuel. News of Frisch's discovery spread quickly, and within days, the Lawrence team successfully split a uranium atom. After World War II broke out, both the United States and Great Britain pursued their own nuclear programs independently. However, it didn't take long for the British team to realize that even though they had the brains, they did not have the resources to develop the atomic bomb. In 1942, Roosevelt approved the project. It was given the code name Manhattan Engineer District, an innocuous name meant to conceal the project's real purpose. Army engineer Colonel Leslie Richard Groves was put in charge of the project. Groves was given a promotion to Brigadier General, access to an unlimited budget, and the highest security clearance available. One of Groves' first acts was to secure as much uranium as possible from the Congo, the greatest producer of the element. Having succeeded in that endeavor, he moved on to his next task, identifying the lead scientist for the project. For that position, he chose a member of Lawrence's team and one of the top nuclear physicists in the nation, Julius Robert Oppenheimer. For the location of the laboratory, they wanted a place that was remote enough for secrecy, but also close to a major city and had easy access to water. Groves and Oppenheimer decided Los Alamos, New Mexico was the ideal location. Oppenheimer quickly assembled a team of the greatest nuclear physicists from the U.S. and around the world. Many of them were Jewish emigres from Europe who were personally motivated to defeat the Germans. The team also included Enrico Fermi, who left fascist Italy with his Jewish wife. The Manhattan Project would turn out to be one of the largest human endeavors ever, certainly in the number of people involved, resources consumed, and its incredibly quick completion time. The project involved three nations, the United States, Great Britain, and Canada. It employed 130,000 people. Research and production took place across those three nations at more than 30 separate sites. The total cost of the project would be $2 billion, or $26 billion in today's currency. All of this occurred while those working on the project needed to maintain top-level secrecy. The work involved obtaining and mining enormous amounts of raw uranium, 
1,200 tons were imported from the Belgian Congo to make an end product of less than 100 kilograms of enriched uranium. One team of workers was tasked with determining how the device would trigger a critical mass. By shotgun method of shooting a small chunk of uranium into a large chunk, or by implosion method, exploding an outer shell onto an inner core. On July 16, 1945, the project team was ready to test their first bomb. The device, codenamed Trinity, was hoisted to the top of a 100-foot-high steel tower to simulate being dropped from a bomber. With all of the project leaders on hand, including Groves, Oppenheimer, Lawrence, and Fermi, the device was exploded. It released the energy of 20,000 tons of TNT, creating a crater 250 feet wide, a mushroom cloud seven and a half miles high, and a shock wave that was felt more than 100 miles away. The world had entered the atomic age. So what was happening on the other side of the Pacific during this time? In the early phases of World War II, even predating the German invasion of Poland in 1939, the Japanese imperial government had embarked on a plan to build a major global empire through military conquest. In 1937, after defeating Chinese forces, they occupied Manchuria. By 1941, they controlled most of coastal China. In retaliation for these aggressive acts, the governments of the U.S., Great Britain, China, and the Netherlands established an embargo against Japan. Deprived of the resources needed, not just for the military, but for daily survival, Japan felt it had no choice but to prepare for all-out war against the embargoing nations. On December 7, 1941, Japan struck out in all directions, bombing the American base of Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, attacking the British colony of Hong Kong, invading the American-controlled nation of the Philippines, attacking Thailand from land bases they held in French Indochina, and invading the British colony of Malaya. The Imperial Japanese Army scored a number of impressive victories, crippling the U.S. Pacific Fleet, conquering Thailand in less than 24 hours, taking 130,000 British and Allied troops prisoner in Singapore, and annexing Malaya, the Dutch East Indies, New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, and the Philippines. By 1942, Japan controlled a massive sea-based empire that stretched from northern China to Burma in the west, to the Dutch East Indies in the south, and to the Aleutian Islands in the east. They were at the doorstep of both Australia and the United States. The tide began to turn in April 1942 with the Doolittle Raid. American bombers took off from an aircraft carrier positioned 600 miles off the Japanese coast and bombarded Tokyo. Damage was minimal, but it was a huge morale boost for the United States and a blow against Japanese pride. A month later, U.S. and Australian forces used the aid of codebreakers to counter the Japanese attack at Coral Sea. Despite major Allied losses, the Japanese were turned back and suffered their own losses. Those losses would be felt by the Japanese at the Battle of Midway, a major Allied victory that checked Japanese expansion. The Japanese suffered more losses during the drawn-out Battle of Guadalcanal, fighting a combined U.S. and Australian force. By this time, they were becoming acutely aware that they had lost their air and sea superiority. The Japanese never quite recovered from Midway. The embargo was having a profound effect on their ability to wage war. American industrial capacity had overwhelmed those of the Japanese. The Allies employed a leapfrogging strategy which involved bypassing the most heavily fortified islands held by the Japanese and attacking the less fortified but strategically important islands. The aim was to disrupt the Japanese supply lines and eventually occupy an island that was within bombing range of mainland Japan. The Allied forces slowly worked their way to mainland with the capture of the islands Saipan, Guam, and Tinian. The Allied forces slowly worked their way to the mainland with the capture of the islands Saipan, Guam, and Tinian. On March 26, 1945, they secured the island of Iwo Jima. On June 21st, they secured Okinawa and could now use heavy bombers against Japan without impediment.
The horror and devastation of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki tend to overshadow all the death and destruction that the Allies inflicted on the Japanese mainland prior to those two bombings. Following the Doolittle Raid, the Allies began bombing Japan from bases in China and India. But the distance of these airfields to industrial targets in Japan was limited by the flying distance of the bombers. With the capture of Guam, Saipan, and Tinian Islands in the Marianas, the Allies were able to construct six airfields that could accommodate hundreds of B-29 Super Fortresses, the premier heavy bomber of the United States Air Force. Resupply was easier in the Pacific, and the bombers were now in range of Tokyo and other major Japanese cities. In the winter of 1944, the Allies began dropping incendiary cluster bombs on urban targets to reduce Japan's industrial capacity. The bombs contained napalm or jelly gasoline. They were incredibly effective at starting intense fires within a wide radius of the bombing site. The United States experimented with these incendiary bombing raids with little success. In March 1945, U.S. Air Force Major General Curtis LeMay changed his tactics. Bombing raids would be at night when Japanese defense was weaker. Altitudes of the bombers would drop from 30,000 feet, which was out of range of anti-aircraft guns, to 5,000 feet. And the guns were removed from the bombers to allow them to carry more bombs. On the night of March 9th, 10th, Operation Meeting House was carried out against Tokyo. During that raid, 279 B-29 bombers dropped 1,665 tons of incendiary bombs on the city. The skies over Tokyo lit up with the bright colors of flame. 16 square miles of the city were leveled by fire. Nearly 84,000 people were killed and another 40,000 injured. The raid also managed to knock out a good chunk of Japan's war production capacity. The firebombing of Tokyo was the most destructive air raid of World War II, surpassing Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Following the raid, Japan began to evacuate children and the elderly from cities to the countryside. Similar raids were carried out against the cities of Nagoya and Osaka. The bombings continued through the rest of spring 1945, reattacking Tokyo and Nagoya, as well as Kawasaki, Hamamatsu, and Yokohama. Japanese Imperial air defenses proved completely ineffectual in preventing these air raids. During the raids, the quality of life in Japan was steadily deteriorating. The rice harvest was the worst it had been since 1909. Due to the U.S. naval blockade, food imports were down. There was also no oil being imported. Metal was scarce and aircraft were being constructed from wooden parts. Coal production was also down, but the greatest shortage was even more apparent. The cities were devoid of young men who were either away at war, wounded, or dead. The Japanese war machine was grinding to a halt. It is hard to imagine in this post-Dick Cheney era that there was once a time when very little was expected of the American vice president until the president died. During the Roosevelt administration, the vice president was often kept in the dark about important projects and plans. On April 12, 1945, President Roosevelt died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Harry Truman had only been vice president for 82 days when he received the news that he would be assuming the presidency. He must have been a bit overwhelmed. Shortly after taking office, he told the press corps, Boys, if you ever pray, pray for me now. I feel like the moon, the stars, and all of the planets have fallen on me. It was on that day that Truman was first told about the highly destructive weapon the government had been working on. It was nearly a full two weeks later that he found out that weapon was the atomic bomb. It was the first time he was told about the Manhattan Project, the plants, the laboratories, the tens of thousands of employees, the cost... It was the first time he learned the United States was just months away from developing a weapon that could, as the Secretary of War put it, end civilization. Less than a month after taking office, the war in Europe was over, and the President and the nation could focus on the war in the Pacific. In July of that year, Truman, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin met at Potsdam, Germany, to discuss how to end the war and what the post-war world would look like. Truman waited patiently during this time to hear word of a positive result from the Trinity test. On July 16th, he received the good news, and he couldn't wait to tell his Soviet counterpart 
that America now had a little something-something that would end the war right quickly. Stalin reacted very coolly to this bit of information. As it turned out, Stalin knew as much about the Manhattan Project as Truman did, thanks to countless Soviet spies and informants working on the project. Little did Truman realize at the time that the Cold War had already begun before the hot war had finished. On July 26th, Truman and Churchill, with the consent of Chinese leader General Lisimo Chiang Kai-shek, released the Potsdam Declaration demanding the unconditional surrender of Japanese armed forces. If they refused, the Allies threatened Japan with its prompt and utter destruction. Stalin was not included or even notified regarding this declaration. The Japanese leadership attempted to make several entreaties to the Soviet government, asking them to intervene or assist Japan in pursuing peace terms that would allow them to save face. However, Stalin was not as interested in helping the Japanese as the Japanese leadership had hoped. He still had his eye on some prime territories in East Asia. In May of 1945, a group of select scientists and military personnel met in Oppenheimer's office in Los Alamos. This so-called target committee was tasked with selecting the target or targets where the bomb would be dropped. Their top question was which of the unbombed cities in Japan would best demonstrate the destructive power of the atomic bomb. Groves ticked off a list of important factors to consider. The city must possess sentimental value to the Japanese to reduce their will to fight. The target must have military significance. The city must be mostly intact in order to properly demonstrate destructiveness of the weapon, and it must be a city big enough to absorb the magnitude of the bomb blast. Tokyo and Yokohama were already rubble, so they were off the list. Kyoto, Japan's ancient capital, was almost like the holy land to most Japanese. Secretary of War Henry Stimson struck it from the list. That left Hiroshima, a city of 300,000 people, a military manufacturing center that had not been previously bombed with incendiaries. Hiroshima it is, then. The committee took up other questions. Should they bomb the target with incendiaries after the atomic bombing? Does radiation kill more effectively in dry or wet weather? Should the bomb be dropped on a selected target or just the center of the city? Then came the question of demonstration bombing. Should the bomb be publicly announced and then dropped in an unpopulated area where there would be no casualties as a demonstration of its destructive potential? This question was brought up several times and shot down several times. Secretary of State James Burns offered several reasons why that was a bad idea. The bomb could be a dud. The Japanese might shoot the plane down. American POWs might be moved into the target zone. And a demonstration without casualties would not be enough to convince the Japanese to surrender. No, a demonstration bombing would be too risky. The atomic bomb would need to be dropped on a high population center without warning. Someone asked, would the atomic bomb have any more of a psychological effect than the incendiary bombs they had been using on major urban targets? Oppenheimer appeared offended by the suggestion. The visual effect of the atomic bomb would be tremendous, he said. It would be accompanied by a luminescence which would rise to a height of 10 to 20,000 feet. The neutron effect of the explosion would be dangerous to life for a radius of at least two-thirds of a mile. He argued that this was far more impressive than the incendiary bombings. At least 20,000 people would die in the attack, he claimed. The committee wrapped up its work with three unanimous agreements. One, the atomic bomb should be dropped as soon as possible. Two, it should be dropped without warning. And three, it should be used on war plants surrounded by workers' homes or other buildings susceptible to damage in order to make a spectacular impression on as many inhabitants as possible. That last line was worded to appease Stimson. But don't be fooled, it's a cautious way of saying the bomb should be dropped on a high population target. In the months leading up to August, the situation grew progressively worse for Japan. With the war in Europe over, the big three nations of Britain, the Soviet Union, and the United States could turn their attention to defeating Japan. Millions of troops were transferred from the European theater to the Pacific theater. By the summer of 1945, the Japanese Air Force and Japanese Navy were practically non-existent. 
Allied bombers were attacking the mainland from airfields in Iwo Jima and Okinawa with impunity. The major cities were rapidly being depopulated either by casualties or by citizens fleeing to the countryside. Remember, kids, air superiority is no laughing matter. While the Americans were attacking from above, the Soviets were building up troops along the Manchurian border. The rickety neutrality pact that Japan and the Soviet Union had signed early in the war wasn't worth the paper it was printed on. What was left of Japanese fighter aircraft had been mostly converted to kamikaze planes, and as metal was becoming scarcer, the planes were being constructed out of a greater percentage of wooden parts. By July, the Imperial Army had returned 16 to 20 divisions to the mainland in preparation for an American-led invasion. Still, the Japanese Army High Command pressed on. Privately acknowledging in 1944 they had no hope of winning the war, they urged citizens to arm themselves with whatever weapons were available and prepare to take on the Americans in hand-to-hand -hand combat. For the Japanese military leaders, the future course was obvious. The Allies were to sue for peace, or the Japanese were prepared to die to the last man. For the Allies, the objective was also clear. Nothing short of unconditional surrender would be acceptable. While the Japanese were recruiting 15-year-old boys into the service for suicide missions, younger children were crafting sharpened bamboo sticks in preparation for the inevitable American invasion of their homeland. At the same time, the USS Indianapolis and three C-54 cargo planes were delivering the separate parts of the Little Boy and Fat Man weapon devices to the tiny island of Tinian in the North Marianas. By August, the bombs were completely assembled and the crews trained and prepared to deliver their payload. On the 6th of August, under clear skies, the Enola Gay dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Instantly, 80,000 people, or almost one-third of the population, were killed. Victims of the bombing suffered numerous horrific injuries. Those who were not incinerated or otherwise killed by the blast had to contend with blindness, third-degree burns, extreme excruciating thirst, pieces of debris and broken glass or melted glass on their bodies, and for many, loose, melted skin that drooped from their bones. The blast shredded clothing, or in many cases burned their clothing off completely. Many people ended up drowning in rivers, attempting to soothe the pain of their burns or quench their enormous thirst. Later that day it began to rain. It was not a natural rain. It was a man-made rain caused by moisture condensing on the rising ash and dust, then returning to earth as oily, sooty droplets. Many thought this black rain was gasoline being dropped by the Americans. As the city burned from the numerous fires started by the explosion, the survivors were either stumbling out of town to take refuge elsewhere or seeking the comfort of bomb shelters. Medical workers described a strange disease affecting them. Its symptoms were fever, diarrhea, nausea, and complications leading to death. Many thought it was dysentery, but others recognized it as something different. They called it the A-bomb disease. What they were encountering was radiation sickness. The next day, American aircraft dropped millions of leaflets all over Japan and announced the same message over U.S.-operated broadcast radio. We are in the possession of the most destructive, explosive weapon ever devised by man. It has the same explosive power as 2,000 of our giant B-29s. This awful fact is one for you to ponder, and we solemnly assure you it is grimly accurate. We have just begun to use this weapon against your homeland. Before we use this bomb to destroy every resource the military uses to prolong this useless war, we ask that you petition the emperor to end the war. Tokyo's leaders refused to admit that America had dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. They claimed it was a conventional attack unleashed by hundreds of B-29s, although this information conflicted with what the survivors of Hiroshima had witnessed. The Japanese cabinet was of two camps. The civilian members were hoping that the news of the atomic bomb would bring about the opportunity to end the war. The military members of the cabinet were still committed to fighting to the last man. Some of them thought the Americans only had one bomb and they used it at Hiroshima. They held firm to the belief that the American public would not tolerate the high casualties of a land invasion, and they clung tightly to the long-held samurai tradition. 
when you have a choice between life and death, always choose death. Both sides realized the final word on the matter lay with the emperor, for even though he had little actual power, if he instructed the military to end the war, they would listen to him. But for the time being, it did not appear at all that the Japanese leaders were intimidated by the Americans' nuclear arsenal. Meanwhile, on the Russian-Chinese border in Japanese-occupied Manchuria, the situation was ramping up. Stalin had promised earlier in the year at the Yalta Conference to invade Japan exactly three months after Germany's surrender, which happened on May 8th. Now troops, guns, tanks, and pontoon bridges were being redeployed from their western front to their eastern front. By the beginning of August, the Soviets had more than one and a half million soldiers stationed at the border. Stalin was very displeased by the Americans' use of the atomic bomb. To him it appeared as a joint British-American operation that bypassed Russia completely. The maneuvering between the Western and Eastern allies that started with the outbreak of the war was growing more intense. Stalin not only wanted to avenge the defeat of the Russian army at the hands of the Japanese in 1905, he wanted to take a bite out of Manchuria and other Japanese-held territories. On the eve of August 8th, Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov informed Japanese Ambassador Naotake Sato that the Soviet Union was formally declaring war against Japan. At midnight, those one and a half million Red Army soldiers supported by tanks, artillery, and aircraft crossed into Japanese-held lands along a 3,000-mile front. The pride of the Japanese military, the Kwantung Army, based in Manchuria, was completely unprepared and entirely overwhelmed by the Soviet forces. 600,000 Japanese soldiers were captured and 80,000 killed. Another 1 million were cut off and separated from mainland Japan. The Japanese commanders seemed to dread a Russian land invasion more than another atomic bomb. They were looking forward to a heroic last stand against the Americans, but knew the Russians were motivated by the defeat of 1905. If the Russians invaded Japan instead of the Americans, they would offer no quarter. Conversely, the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima had happened so recently they hadn't had time to understand the destruction that took place there. On the morning of August 9th, the B-29 bomber named Boxcar took off from the airfield at Tinian. Its payload was the nuclear bomb called Fat Man. Unlike Little Boy, Fat Man was filled with plutonium rather than uranium. It used the implosion method rather than the shotgun method for detonation. It relied on the principle of fusion rather than fission. For that reason, it was expected to deliver a much more powerful explosion than the Little Boy bomb did at Hiroshima. It took off for its target in Japan without direct written or verbal consent from President Truman. That consent had been implied when Truman handed off authority to his military leaders. General Groves had decided, for maximum psychological impact, the second bomb needed to be dropped on Japan as soon as it was ready. Unlike the flight of the Enola Gay, the flight of Boxcar was filled with unexpected events. Two hours into the flight, Boxcar flew into a powerful electrical storm. The captain of the mission, Major Charles Sweeney, did what he could to fly around the storm, but to no avail. Lightning flashed all around the plane while Sweeney did what he could to navigate through the turbulence. Eventually, they cleared the storm, but not after expending a great deal of fuel. Then, during a standard check, Lieutenant Phil Barnes discovered a flashing red light on the bomb's fuse monitor. Following several tense moments, Barnes identified the problem as two incorrectly installed switches. He fixed the problem. If it had gone unnoticed, the bomb would have failed to detonate. The weather over their prime target, the city of Kukura, was reported as sunny and clear. There was a long delay as Sweeney attempted to regroup with the other two planes in his formation. The delay consumed more of their precious fuel. By the time they were in position over Kukura, the weather conditions had changed. Dark, hazy smoke now filled the skies due to a recent bombing of a nearby city by American aircraft. The first run ended in failure. The bombardier... Kermit Behan could not see the target. Second runs were unprecedented, but Sweeney ordered it. During the next approach, Boxcar drew enemy flak fire from the ground. The second run also failed due to lack of visibility. Sweeney ordered a third run. By this time, Japanese fighters were scrambling to take on the bombers. 
but on the third approach, the crew failed once again to locate its target. Sweeney called off the primary target after expending a great deal of badly needed fuel. Determined, he headed for the secondary target, the southern city of Nagasaki. Nagasaki was chosen for several reasons. It was one of Japan's busiest seaports and also a manufacturer of military weaponry and ordnance. Like Hiroshima, the city had also been untouched by Allied bombing. At 11 a.m., Boxcar approached Nagasaki, running dangerously low on fuel. Cloud cover had only grown worse since the attempt on Kokura, as an approaching storm covered 90% of the skies. Behan was having difficulty spotting the target once again. But as they approached the drop zone, an opening in the cloud cover appeared. Two and a half miles away from the intended target, Behan realized this might be his one chance. He released the weapon. Bombs away, he shouted to the crew. Then he corrected himself. Bomb away. The explosion caused the horizon to burst into super brilliant white with an intense flash, much more intense than Hiroshima. William Lawrence, the lone reporter on the mission from the New York Times, described it as a giant pillar of purple fire, like a meteor coming from the earth instead of outer space, becoming ever more alive as it climbed skyward. It was a living thing, a new species of being, born right before our incredulous eyes. Rather than hitting the downtown or industrial center, the Fat Man device exploded over the Yurikami district, a densely populated neighborhood with Japan's largest Christian community. At 22 kilotons, the bomb was almost twice as powerful as Little Boy. More than 39,000 people died instantly, fewer than in Hiroshima, as the surrounding hills absorbed much of the initial damage. Within a one-mile radius of ground zero, no living creature survived. The perfectual Kiho Junior High School was completely obliterated, leaving no trace behind. Its 187 school children and 10 teachers immediately killed. The lone factory in the area, the Mitsubishi Steel and Arms Factory, was completely blown apart. However, most of its crucial military functions remained protected underground. Eight POWs in a nearby prisoner camp also died, most of them Dutch. Any survivor within one mile of the blast suffered third-degree burns from ultraviolet light, and since black clothing absorbed the rays and white clothing reflected the rays, many people suffered burns to their skin that mirrored the patterns of their clothing. The damage was less severe at Nagasaki than it was at Hiroshima, owing more to the targeted area than to the device. But the results were similar. Survivors suffered numerous injuries including cuts, burns, and loose skin that hung from the bone. The ravenous thirst caused by the blast of heat left many survivors pleading for water, which they drank as fast as they could. The rapid rehydration killed them quickly. Scores of refugees formed long lines seeking shelter away from the blast zone. Many that survived the initial blast died in the hours and days after from their injuries. Boxcar did manage to make it safely to Okinawa, running out of fuel on the landing strip. On the day the bomb was dropped, the Japanese cabinet was meeting to discuss whether the war effort should continue or not. Again, the six members of the cabinet were equally divided between the war and the peace parties. Three hours into their meeting, they received news of the atomic bombing of Nagasaki. There was a slight pause in the conversation as the members digested this information. Then, according to the official records, they continued their argumentation without mention of this latest event. They agreed to meet later in the day at a meeting that would include other important government officials, and a request was made asking Emperor Hirohito to attend the meeting. This went strictly against protocol. It was not the divine emperor's role to attend to the worldly affairs of his government or his people. His job was to hear the decisions made by his cabinet, not to offer his opinion on important matters. He rarely intervened, and the one time he gave direct orders was to put down a military coup in 1936. The discussion now focused on the terms of surrender. The hardliners had four conditions they needed met by the enemy. Nobody touches the emperor that Japanese forces withdraw of their own volition, that any alleged war criminals be tried by the Japanese government, and no foreign occupation of the mainland. The liberals had one condition. Nobody touches the emperor. The meeting started at midnight. 
At 2 a.m., the Prime Minister bowed to the Emperor and asked him for his opinion. The Emperor responded, I've been told that we have confidence in our victory, but the reality doesn't match our projections. For example, the War Minister told me that the defense positions along the coast would be ready by mid-August, but it is not yet ready. I've heard that we have no more weapons left for new divisions. In this situation, there is no prospect of victory over the American and British forces. The time has come to bear the unbearable in order to save the people from disaster. Then he told his full cabinet he supported the peace party in its lone condition. It was time to surrender. At that point, the emperor cried, and all of the members of the cabinet followed suit. The Americans accepted this surrender on condition, as long as they could call it an unconditional surrender back home. The emperor could stay, but he would have to report to the American command stationed in Japan. The most important condition for the Americans was that the United States be allowed to occupy Japan. Thank you, comrade, but entering the war just two days ago gets you bupkis. Of their own initiative, the Soviets took North Korea as a consolation prize. The Imperial Japanese government announced its surrender on August 15th and formally signed the declaration on September 2nd. The world's most lethal war had finally drawn to a close. For the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there would be great physical and emotional pain. The survivors are called Hibaksha, the explosion-affected people. In the weeks after the bombings, many apparently healthy and unhurt people started dying. Their symptoms included bleeding gums, fatigue, hair loss, nausea, and fever. Those who were not present at the blast but entered the bombed areas afterward also exhibited symptoms such as ulceration of the mouth, balding, bleeding from orifices, gangrene, and subcutaneous hemorrhaging. Women who were pregnant miscarried. The miscarriage rate within one mile of ground zero was 100%. The death rate after the bombings was increasing, not declining. Doctors in America and Britain compared these symptoms to others that had been previously recorded by people exposed to gamma radiation. It was called radiation sickness. Other victims developed thick, overgrown scars called keloids that would remain for the rest of their lives. It is estimated that the total number of people who died at Hiroshima and Nagasaki during and after the atomic bombs were dropped to be over 200,000. Next month will mark the 70th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. During those 70 years, there has been no repeat of a nuclear attack. The invention of the bomb certainly didn't scare anyone away from wanting the bomb. Britain, Germany, the Soviet Union, and the United States were all working on being the first to develop the bomb. The Cold War had already gotten underway just as World War II was winding down. The Soviet Union and its allies would get into a nuclear arms race with the United States and its allies. By 1985, at the height of the Cold War, there were more than 68,000 nuclear weapons in the world. Today, that figure has come down to 10,000, but that would still be a sufficient number to wipe out humanity. The weapons only grew more powerful and more destructive since their use on Japan. The Soviets tested a 50 megaton bomb in 1961. That would be equivalent to 4,000 Hiroshima bombs. Delivery methods would change. Nuclear warheads are delivered by missile now and not dropped by bombers. The missiles can be hidden on land in silos, launched from the air by planes, or launched from beneath the sea by submarines. This triad strategy is designed to make it harder to take out one country's entire stockpile of weapons. The number of countries with nuclear weapons has also expanded. In addition to the United States, it now includes Russia, China, Britain, France, India, Pakistan, North Korea, and most likely Israel, although they haven't publicly admitted having the weapon. We also know that Iran has been pursuing development of its own nuclear warhead. Yet during all that time, and during all that build-up, there hasn't been one nuclear bomb used by one nation against another. It's a pretty remarkable feat. I have to think what happened in Japan had something to do with that. Until those bombs were dropped, what they would do to human targets was based purely on theory. Hiroshima and Nagasaki gave us a clear idea of what a nuclear explosion would look like if used on a human target. The results were horrifying. Perhaps we've been lucky over these 70 years because we actually saw what a nuclear weapon would do to us. 
it may have had the effect of discouraging political leaders from using it. It's possible we'd get the same result if the bomb was never dropped on a civilian population, but I think the psychological effect is hard to deny. Was it the right thing to do at the time? Possibly the war would have ended when it did without the devastation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The biggest contributing factor may have been the entry of the Soviet Union into the war against Japan. Coupled with the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the possibility of even more atomic bombs being dropped, it's hard to imagine the Emperor's decision wasn't impacted by the bomb. Truman claimed he saved one million lives by dropping the bomb, and thus preventing the United States from having to invade the Japanese mainland. We may never know if that claim would have been correct, but it is safe to say a confluence of events that were beyond the control of the Japanese leadership caused that country to finally surrender and end the war. Thank you again for listening. I greatly appreciate all of your support. Please tell your friends, your enemies, and your frenemies about the show. You can find the podcast of Doom on iTunes, Stitcher, and Blueberry. I'm also working on expanding our reach. You can visit the website at www.thepodcastofdoom.com or like us on Facebook. Please do email me with any comments, questions, or suggestions. The email address is podcastofdoom at aol.com. Thank you for your support, and wow, it is so great to be back. In the next episode, we will look at the Great Iranian Blizzard of 1972. It was the most fatal snowstorm ever, and you will never believe so much snow can fall in one place in so little time. If you're baking in the summer heat like I am, you may just enjoy this ultra-cool show. Until then, keep your ears pinned and your tail taut.